But for those of you that know me, you know I come with a disclaimer. Right? I'm not here to offend anyone. I'm here to help us overcome. Right? I appreciate the, uh, the invite here uh, today. And um, I don't represent the church. I represent a church. And I have to say that because, you know, a lot, the faith community has a lot to do with the epidemic. I, I get that. I understand the, the hurt. I've experienced the hurt myself. Said, but instead of complaining about the hurt, I decided to be the change that I wanted to, to be. So here we have the title of the new HIV strategy, uh, Forward, Ever, Backwards, Never. And I had to ask myself, why would you even ask the pastor to do this? Right? And then I said, well, I guess it makes sense because I have to look at my gifting because the gifting is somewhat prophetic or visionary. Let me say that. Because I can say that before linkage became linkage, we were linking folks. Before testing became what it is today, we were doing 833 tests, about 2 to 3 percent positivity rate, and folks were getting in front of the doctor within 72 hours. But I realized also that I wasn't just dealing with HIV. I did all of the trips to DC, I did all the conferences, I did all of that, and I stopped because as I was doing all of that, I realized that if I was out, then who was doing the work? So when we say the end of HIV is near or the end of HIV by 2030, we're really exercising faith in a weird kind of way because we don't know what 2030 is going to bring. But I have to say that if we look to the end, do we even know what the end of HIV looks like? Because oftentimes I ask folks, well, if HIV ended, what would you do? And they don't know. You ask me, I know what I want to do. I want to have a bed and breakfast someplace. I don't want to be doing this for 30 years. 10 years has been rough. It has felt like 30 years, trust me. But we have to go ahead and begin to look to the end, to start talking about what the end really looks like. And that story that I had here, see, two years ago, I started dealing with my own Jane, Michelle. So she came to us and simply just asked for prayer. She had gangrene in her hands that literally, they look like burnt wood. We found out that she had an HIV diagnosis. She also said she needed prayer because she was pregnant. We just placed her in housing three days ago. Two years ago, and just placed her in housing three years ago. So I, so I know that it's not easy doing some of the things that we have to do, but this is really a testament to the fact that the systems are broken. I shouldn't have to go over here for case management and then go on the other side of town, said to get housing, and then go over here because I got to get a TB test, and then I got to go back downtown to get ID, especially when I don't have transportation, because we talked a little bit about social determinants of health, and transportation is rough, right? So, so one, I think, before we start talking about new strategy, we have to talk about fixing some of the systems, because you really can't put new wine into old wineskins. Right? Then when we look at epidemiology, it's really social justice without the tears. But here's my issue with the data. Data tells us the what, but it doesn't answer the question, why? So everyone is pretty much familiar with the care cascade, correct? And we have all of these people that have HIV and it sort of goes to those that are tested, those that are linked, those that are put on antiretrovirals, and it goes all the way down to those that are virally suppressed. The first box needs to be social determinants of health. We gotta start addressing the things that are quote unquote causing the HIV in the first place. And then I think there's a last box that we always miss is healing. Because once I become virally suppressed, then what? What are those things that are keeping people? What, what, what's the why? of why people aren't taking PrEP or using condoms or whatever it may be or not getting tested. We, we never address that. Data, and I hear a lot of leaders say this, oh, well, we have to follow the epidemic, follow the epidemic. We've heard it here today. But if we're following the epidemic, then how do we lead it? That's already happened. You can't change that. But what are we learning by what we have seen in the data? That done messed some of y'all up. 
Because I know we've sort of built our jobs around following the data. And I, I mean, data's good, but it doesn't, it tells us the what, it doesn't answer the question as to the why. And I think we have to begin asking ourselves about the why. Leadership, I truly believe leadership needs a push back from the table. He done upset some more yeah. folks. I'm gonna let it marinate. Because I told y'all, I ain't come here to uh, offend, I just help overcome. But if you've been doing this for 35 years, it's time to go ahead and start training some new, new thought. I'm just saying. We're looking at the data. I'm going to talk about Atlanta. We looked at the data here in Atlanta. We ain't doing good. When I started doing this 10 years ago, numbers have increased. Same leaders sitting at the table. Push back. You ate enough. <laughs> See, I don't get money from nobody. I say what I want to say. But if we're constantly at the table and clamoring to be at the table to have our voices heard, when do we get new thought? We keep throwing money at the same folk that ain't coming up with nothing new. So do we need a new strategy? No, we ain't used the strategies we had. We, what, what the new one, the end of this stat, and we had the, the national, uh, Nicole talk about, it's the same thing. We were supposed to end it by 2020. I was excited. Started in 2009. Y'all met two years ago and said 2030. 2025 is going to be 2040? I said at lunch, I said if it had got to 2019 and we had a meeting and said we're almost there, we need two more years, that would set just a little bit better with my spirit. But we met two, two years ago, I believe it was, and said 2030. I'm confused by that, because have we really done what we said that we were going to do when we said that we were going to end HIV? And we said that that was faith, that we believe that this is what we're going to do. But here's the problem. Faith without works is what? Dead. That's the problem. Uh -huh. We ain't working to end it. We working to work. We working to get a check. Amen. We working to come to a conference and not go into the office today. <laughs> Because, Virginia, I know you're not here. There's some folks here that work in Atlanta I don't see. And I live here in Atlanta. I don't see. No invitations for Sunday coming. I'm OK. But, but at the end of the day, look, we got to push back from the table, y'all. And we got to begin to actually do the real work. And the real work ain't pretty. I don't wear this suit often, believe me. Sunday morning, I don't wear a suit anymore. Sunday morning, I had to take the 40-minute message to 7, because folks weren't trying to hear 40 minutes. I'm not even comfortable standing up here talking down at y'all. I'm comfortable on the floor talking to you. As a pastor, I got receipts. You come to church, there's communion on the front table and condoms on the back table. Right. And starting last Sunday, we do needle exchange. That's the reality. That's the reality. Preachers get upset with me. Oh, you know, as a faith leader, you shouldn't be doing that. I got to save souls and save lives. You talking to empty pews. I'm talking to folks that's come to get a sandwich, come to get a needle, whatever it may be. They're there, though. And y'all want to work with the church. Just like you don't have great relationships with the community, you don't have relationships with churches. We can't test, and I think it was a, a Nicole or one of the other speakers, we can't be testing from 9 to 5 and think we're going to get a grip, grip on this. You're going to have to work some OT, some nights, some weekends, and a holiday. I do. There used to be an agency here that closed from Thanksgiving to New Year's. I ain't going to say the name. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about, though. But you used to close, because what? As if HIV went on vacation. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, I got to link somebody, and I think L is still here. I call L. I have to text L. 
I got to get this person in the camp. They ain't going to come back Monday. I got them Friday night at 3 o'clock. L fuss, but L come out. She pick them up, get them in the care. Leave y'all alone. <laughs> we focus too much on awareness and engagement. Talk about strategy, but we never get to the implementation. We got some great documents out there, what we going to do, but when we going to do it? When does it get down to the actual implementation of what we said that we were going to do? Faith without the works, the ending of HIV without working to end it does not work. It does not work. And it requires us to step out of our comfort zone. I work with the invisible class and what I tell folks when I train across the country, I work with the folks that you don't want to work with. My Jane went to agencies here in Atlanta and nobody wanted to deal with it because they didn't want to deal with the gangrene. They didn't want to deal with the fact that she was on substance. They didn't want to deal with the fact that she was homeless. They didn't want to deal with the fact that on coupled on top of that, she was also pregnant. They just wanted to get the number. Now she has an AIDS diagnosis. We couldn't find her housing, so we built a, a dwelling for her. If you go to my Facebook page, it's literally, it's nothing more than a tool shed because at least I knew where she was in the morning. I had to get up out of my bed and make sure she ate just so she had a meal that day. But we got to get to the implementation and do the work and do the work. If we're going to end this by 2030, we got to stop talking about ending it and begin to go ahead and end it. We're going to have to start forging some, some relationships and some collaborations that ain't going to fit always. But when folks come to me, look, we weren't doing needle exchange. We had to go get an agency to come and partner with us to do it. Made sense to me. I got to serve breakfast, not because ooh, I'm trying to entice folks in, but if folks come up to me, how I look talking about whatever scripture I'm preaching on that day when you hungry. When a family of nine is, is hungry and they're looking for housing, oh, I'm just going to talk about Jonah and the whale? Sometimes the best sermons that I preach are the ones that I live. And that's why we say we're transforming ministry, minds, lives, and souls in order to change communities. So we do work within the, in the HIV field. We do work within homelessness. We do work within poverty. We do work around all of those things. June 15, it's a shameless plug, but June 15th, we're feeding 5,000. Because the area that we're in, when we went out as the church to hand out our Thanksgiving baskets, because, you know, that's what churches do, <laughs> folks were crying when we gave them the baskets. Why are you crying? It's just turkey and some stuff and, you know, and all that. Because they didn't have food that day. This was a Saturday, and we saying, oh, enjoy it on Thursday. So we had to go back and revamp in our assessment and say that we can't hand out frozen turkeys no more. They're going to have to be thawed out so, so folks can go ahead and eat. Or better yet, we're going to have to prepare meals so folks can eat right then and there. Michelle talked about the urgency of now. We don't work in a now. We work sort of like when I get to it. Because lunch is coming up. I get off at five. Got a hair appointment. I know y'all ain't coming Sunday, it's okay. <laughs> Funding, where's the money? Not the money that's coming. What y'all do with the money that we got? <laughs> Statistics says we ain't done too good with the money. We used to get paid on, a, on paid for performance. That's what I personally think should happen. I done been cussed out and put out some rooms for that. But when we're assigned a task, we got to fulfill the task, people. We just can't keep going back to the well. It don't work like that. Really ain't coming on Sunday. <laughs> Community-driven approaches. We think that we can manage HIV from the 12th floor, and we can't. Got to get involved in the community. You got to have relationship with folks. Got to understand where you're coming from. 
So when we had a, a, a young lady come up to us and she was doing sex work, right, I couldn't automatically assume that she just woke up one morning and said she wanted to do sex work. Couldn't automatically assume that she needed an HIV test or anything else. There was no assumption there. But through relationship, we understood that she was really trying to feed her two kids. She had a job, but she wasn't making enough money. So on the weekends, that's what she did to feed her two kids. More relationship, well, baby's father was in jail. So now we're not only working within the HIV arena, we're working in the sex work arena, and then we got to start doing something on incarceration. And I wasn't trained to do none of that in seminary. This is the intersectionality that everybody's talking about right now, that these things sort of overlap. If we're looking to really go ahead and to end this, then we have to have a, a broader perspective. We have to look a little bit further, and that's why I say it has to be somewhat prophetic, so that we have to look into the future and see those partners that we're going to need, because we don't know what's coming through the door. We don't know what's coming through the door. And that's why I'm, I want to close with casting a wider net. As a, as a pastor, as a leader of, of, of the church, of the ministry, anybody that comes through our door, I have to know who I have to be able to call because I do not claim to be an expert at anything because this epidemic changes every single day, every single day. So what we do is we have to cast a wider net. So when someone came and we noticed that she had tracks on her arm, then we knew who to call in order to make the needle exchange happen. I was able to call DeKalb County, I was able to call Fulton County and say that we need, uh, we need condoms. Do you know how odd it is to go into a junkyard, talk to somebody that's shooting up, and then they ask me my name, and I say, Pastor Will. <laughs> after giving them the needles, after, giving them condoms. But that's what it's really about for me. And I know a lot of folks said that they want to work uh, with the church. Why? <laughs> that's really how I feel. When I hear folks in the community that want to work with the church, I, I do ask why. Because it can't be a numbers thing. I can take you into a church of 16,000, because we got big churches, just like y'all got big churches in New York. We got big churches here in Atlanta. 16,000 people are not going to test for HIV. You can get 300, because I've had that happen in a church, but there wasn't any reactors. But I can go ahead and take you to the no steeple church in the bluff, and you can do 10 tests and find four reactors, link two people to care, do some prep, but y'all don't want to show up for that, because that's not enough numbers. Because we struggle to get folks to come and do testing for us, because we're just not big enough for agencies. But we have to cast a wider net. A lot of times folks don't show up because you haven't dealt with your own church hurt. See, the preacher said something that you didn't like, and you ain't trying to work with churches no more. But most of the churches in the zip codes that, that are, are impacted, church will get you in. They'll let you test. I know that. You may not be able to put condoms on the table, but you can put them under the table in a brown paper bag, and Pastor Will told you too. You can go ahead and go to their, their feeding program and test uh, the demographic that you need to test. So we have to begin to work together because really our charge as a faith-based organization, the regional community-based organization, is truly to save lives and save souls. We have to save lives in order to save souls. So I know y'all got some questions because I see some of the snarls that are looking at me. <laughs> and I'm ready, come on. What questions do you have? And, and I want to be respectful of time, so please shut, shut them down. Questions, somebody got some. You ain't got to come to the mic, just yell them out. Oh, yes, ma'am. Hi, everybody. My name is Al. Um, 
I'm the one he was talking about. I've been doing linkage in this community for probably about six years, okay? Um, and I love what Michelle said, okay? But I want to tap on something that William said about leadership because I do see the shift in the community, okay, that's happening. We have, and I hate to use this word millennium because I know it's a bad word, but the millenniums, those are the new ideas. Okay, but at the same time, the old guard is just as good. Okay, so the thing is, we need to learn how to mix these two together so to that balanced. we can be able to produce what needs to happen in this community mm -hmm. because it's not happening. You know, yes, the leaders need to push, push back to the table, but they also need to just push back enough to grab a hold of the millenniums. I agree. Because they have fresh ideas, but they don't have the experience. And that's what we have. So we have, instead of us fighting in this community, making the fight a different fight, because the fight used to be about numbers, the fight used to be about money. Now the fight is about the old guard and the new guard. And we can't continue to do that and expect this epidemic to actually slow down, because it's not. I'm actually, right now, I've been, like I said, I've been doing linkage for six years, but I'm getting ready to step back. You know, I'm getting ready to step back because this linkage is a get paid for your passion job. And if your passion is not there, that's not something that you can do. Linkage is not for everybody, you know. So there's going to have to be a special body to actually do that role. And I'm really hoping, you know, that we would be able to make a difference because now I know that I was helping people on an individual level, but now I have to help people in the multitude. God just happens to shift things. Right. And so now the shift is happening. And I'm just hoping that a change, I can see a change in this community and we just stop doing what we're doing and actually put clients first opposed to the clinics first and do client-centered care because that's what it's all about. It's not about the grants and the money and the na 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 and the politics and the papers. We'll never get anything done. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's, I just wanted to make that comment. All right, thank you, thank you. Yes, hello. I just wanna I just really want to thank you for what you are doing in Barrow County because I didn't know how to address advocacy work, HIV, as a woman living with HIV, um, disclosing to one of the assistant pastors in my church and how was I going to come into the church and do testing. So I do want to thank you for making all of that happen in Barrow County because as of now, people, even negative people, want to be on the bandwagon, that's a bad word to say, but to understand the barriers between women who are positive, what they need, what can we do. So you have really done a great work in thank Barrow you. County. I just want to thank you for that. And, and for, for that, thank you. Thank you, Timmy. And for that, it was really just meeting the pastor where he was. It's like, I'm not going to push something that you want to do. If I can get you to do this much and not get you to do this much, that's a little bit closer to where we want to go. Said, so when we went there just a couple of weeks ago, we talked a little bit about not only having advocates, but also allies. See, advocates can hashtag their way through some issues. Allies get dirty. Allies get dirty. And we talked about being, being more of allies and, and walking with folks. We can advocate for housing, and housing is a thing, but teaching somebody how to budget, pay an electric bill, afford to rent, et cetera. That's really working as, as an ally. And that's what our ministry is really uh, trying to do through the, through the various uh, resources that we have is to walk alongside of folks and, uh, and help them uh, with what they need to do. My oh, sister? Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very much appreciated. I like to think of myself as an ally. Uh, what you have just said is a global problem. The same thing is happening in Africa now. Mm -hmm. The reason I mention Africa, because I work in Africa with HIV, and what you speak about is what I see in Africa, but it's more virulent because there's no fresh water, mm -hmm. there's poor or there's lack of preventative care, there's poor sanitation and hygiene. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, your work is so uh, you. Uh, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi. I wanted to ask a question. I work for an organization that goes out and do um, HIV testing in mm -hmm. the, in the um, community. One of the hardest part problems that I'm having with them is that when we go out, they keep testing the same folks over mm -hmm. and over and over. Mm -hmm. And I'm, by me being new at the organization, they tend not to want to listen to me. Okay. But I'm trying to get them to get out the box right. and go other places mm -hmm. and test other people. And I wonder how can I convey that to them, how important it is. Like you were saying, going to the clubs and stuff like that. Right. But when I mentioned it, nobody don't, you know, we work nine to five. We work nine to five. Okay, we work nine to five. But then there might be a day that we might have to work, you know, seven to 12 mm -hmm. or whatever the case might be. But I can't get them to listen to my, my input. Right. Right. So how would I go about, you know, getting and, them to listen? And, and I hear that a lot of people going places and testing the same folks because they yeah. keep going to the same places yeah. to test. So, and they so, think they're going to get positive. Right. And, 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 and I get it. And my response to you is really have a, a, a hard conversation with, with management uh, about what you would like to do. Because I think a lot of times we're scared to take that to, to managers. Mm -hmm. So when I talked about the junkyard the other day, I know ain't nobody testing at the junkyard because y'all don't know nothing about the junkyard. Right. But you go into the junkyard, there's 14 folks. And this is literally a junkyard. Mm -hmm. There are 14 folks that are living in that junkyard. Mm -hmm. You're not going to know that unless you have relationships. Yeah. So the HIV is not going to be found at an address. Sure. Right? <laughs> so sometimes you got to go up under the bridge. Sometimes we got to take off, I, I, I wear Converse's as well. Sometimes I got to take off my kids and put on some work boots and it's 114 degrees outside because I'm stepping on needles, use condoms and different things of that nature. So, but if any of you need some places to actually test where you want to test for positives, holla. Because we've been wanting folks to go and we can't get folks to go. But, and, and, and that's fine, but here's the thing. If you're going to go, you ain't going with your protocols. You're going to go with mine. <laughs> I'll tell you that, because your protocols ain't working. They ain't work. They ain't working. They ain't working. Since we want to deal with data, we're dealing with data. They ain't working. But you go with my protocols, establish the relationship, do the test, and as Michelle said, you can get the STI test, you can get the TB test, you can get the hep C test, and trust and believe it, it's, it's the same population. We had, um, okay, all right, and then this will be the last question. Thank you. So Reverend Francis, you know, we've had a couple of conversations, some private conversations. So uh, my question to you is similar to the question from earlier. What has been your experience like when you go to certain churches, you know, where you do your training or what have mm -hmm. you, when you would come, well, uh, when, when you encounter people who may have their own uh, preconceived notions about how HIV originates, right. uh, about medication mm -hmm. and things of that nature. How, how do you, what kind of language do you use to combat that, uh, mm -hmm. those preconceived notions? I don't. We spend more time trying to convince the 10% that don't want to hear the message than the 90% that want to hear the message. Everybody want to run to the big mega church. You want the Reverend Dr. Bishop to be on your program, on your billboard, in your uh, campaign. That's not where the folks are that we want to reach. They're at the little garage church or the storefront church, what I call no steeple, not the high steeple. What you run to the high steeple for is when you're trying to pass a bill. Because they got the governor, they got all those folks coming into the high steeple. And I'm not saying that they don't need to be HIV tested, but I'd be ding dinged if I'm at a church of 16,000, I'm going to stand up and I say I want to get an HIV test. I don't want 16,000 people knowing my business. But when I come to the no steeple church, when folks come to our church, they're getting clothes, they got to get food, they're getting a hygiene kit. When we have the shower unit, they're getting a shower. HIV testing is just par for course. It's just par for course. We don't make a big deal. You don't have to go down the hall and, and take the elevator to the ground floor, jump in the bus, go to the south corridor, over to the east campus, knock on the door, give the D. We don't do all of that. Y'all do all of that with that hip and all that other stuff. I do my blood pressure test in Kroger, and people walking by see my blood pressure 300 over 200. So we do the gamut. We don't make that, the HIV testing table the table of death. 
even when we test in churches. You're going to get blood pressure, you're going to get your diabetes, you're going to get your vision, your dental and HIV test and pick up some condoms for your friend or what everybody always says for their son. I'm going to leave y'all alone because y'all ain't, y'all ain't, y'all ain't, y'all ain't, <laughs> they ain't. <laughs>